Hello everyone, I'm your uh, guest speaker. So hello to all of Enlightium and everyone who's watching this retreat. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much talking about myself, so I'm just going to pray and we're just going to begin our word because I think I'm not as important as Jesus is important. And I think as I speak, I think you'll kind of just get to know me anyway. So let me just pray for us and uh, we'll begin. Yeah. Yeah, Lord Jesus, um, I just pray for Enlightium, for all the students, for all the teachers, and for all the parents that are listening. And Lord, we pray uh, for all that are listening, if there's anyone who's just been struggling with this, that, Lord, I don't feel reconciled with you. I don't feel as if I'm really in your presence, or I really don't know you, and I don't know how to come back home. I really pray, Lord, that this message would just... Um, be revealed in a deep way. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would just reveal more of Jesus and the revelation of Jesus. So we just thank you, Lord. We pray for this retreat, Lord, that grace would be realized and now grace would be walked in, Lord. We thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, hello everyone. So I was asked uh, by Mr. Robertson to focus on the topic of grace and I realize your retreat theme is grace and one of the best ways for us to really talk about grace is through another word that I think almost has become a bad word in Christian circles, okay? I'm going to say it and some of you guys are going to be like, wait, that's not a bad word. Or some of you guys might be like, yeah, that's a terrible word. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it, so try not to be too offended. The word is repent, right? I think some of you guys who hear that, I think maybe know what... Other people would say if we use the word repent is some people be like, hey, don't judge me. Don't tell me to repent. Don't, I hate that word, right? Or some people might be like, oh, don't tell me how to live my life, okay? Don't tell me to repent. And I think maybe it's become a bad word because we maybe see it used in different contexts, right? Some of you guys might be thinking, oh, I see that word repent. I see it people having like their signs up, right? Repent. Or, you know, you will go to hell, right? And, and it's not a false statement, but we don't seem to have the right definition of repent because with this theme of your retreat is I think true repentance shows the greatness of grace, right? True repentance doesn't take away from grace, but I actually think that it's more meaningful. And I was thinking about and praying about this message, and I remember... One time with uh, Mr. Robertson, we were on our way uh, to our church and one of the ch uh, church leaders, I was just a leader at that time and Mr. Robertson was, was our head leader and somebody asked him this question, right? Is if we're saved by grace, why do we have to repent, right? We have grace, we don't, we don't need to repent, right? And Mr. Robertson is such a thoughtful person and right? he was thinking about it and, and he gave this answer and I think the message today really encapsulates on that. So can you guys turn to Luke chapter 15, uh, verses 11, okay? Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Some of you guys hear Luke 15, you're like, I've heard this message a thousand times. I, you know what, sure, but let me just spend the time to walk through it and hopefully it'll be something new, right? Luke chapter 15, 11. As you're turning there on your iPhones or Samsungs or Googles or your paper Bible, let me just give some background, right? Jesus began sharing three parables because Jesus was eating with sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes, right? And the Pharisees were disgusted by Jesus, which is interesting, right? Like, how could you be disgusted by Jesus? And you see, Jesus was just accepting these sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes and saying, come to me, come to me, right? And the Pharisees are like, Jesus, how can you eat with these terrible people? Do you know who they are, right? And so Jesus begins with these three parables. And this is the last parable, okay? So I'm going to start with verses 11. And I'm going to read it. And I'll say when to stop, right? Verses 11. And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided property between them. So imagine with me, a younger son is going to his father and saying, hey, can you give me my inheritance? Okay, what does that mean? Some of you guys that look at me would think, oh, our guest speaker is Asian, right? And so in Asian culture as well as Jewish culture, there's something very similar. 
when do you get an inheritance? It's when the, the father or the head of the household dies. So can you imagine the younger son is going to his father and saying, Father, give me the money that I should have when you die. And the father's like, but I'm not dead yet. The younger son's like, exactly, you got my next point. Can we pretend that you're dead and you give me the money? Man, that's pretty dark. That's a savage thing to say, right? Like, Father, I love your money, but I don't really love you. I don't fully trust you. So let's just play pretend and just give me the money as if you were dead, right? And can you imagine the Pharisees are listening to this and the Pharisees are just, yeah, that's why I hate that son. That son's terrible. I can imagine because Korean people do this sometimes too. <laughs> terrible, awful, hate that person, right? And they're probably saying this out loud as Jesus is sharing the story. They're probably interrupting. And can you imagine around Jesus, not only the Pharisees, but the sinners and the tax collectors and prostitutes, they actually look down in shame. They look down because, yeah, I get it. That's about me. I get it because I didn't trust my father God enough that he would provide for me, or I didn't trust him that I'd rather live without him. And I left him, right? But Jesus kind of looks at them and he, and he continues a parable in verse 13. It says, Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So when he went and hired himself out to be one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his feed, fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. I think many of us know that song, Reckless Love. Oh, the never-ending, that a reckless love, God, right? Can you imagine the opposite of that? Oh, the reckless living of my sin that has brought me here, right? It's so funny, that word for squander. Like, he completely, the word is funny. It's like he scattered it. And he's just spread it out in just worthless things, right? And it says so specifically that it was gone. I, I don't know how much of an inheritance that the father had, but he used it. Like, I, I can only imagine, like, how long did it take, right? You know how sometimes as kids we think about, man, if I had a million dollars, I would buy a million Cheetos, right? That's like one dollar per Cheeto bag. Sometimes I could do two for one. Man, I'd be rich, right? Can you imagine you gave a child $100 and the next day, so what'd you do with the $100? It's gone. What? I bought all the candy and I ate it all. And now I have diabetes, right? It's like, what did you do with your life? But that's the word that's used here is he squandered it. He wasted it. It's as if not only did he not care about the father, he didn't even care to think about the inheritance that his father gave him, right? Like, I... I've been waiting to give you this. I've been wanting to give you this. And he's like, I don't care. Everything that has to do with my father, I don't care, right? And so what happens, it, it came to a point that the country was in a famine. The country was bankrupt. There was no food to be had, right? So he went to go work as a pig farmer. And he just, and he wished to even eat the food that the pigs ate. I don't know if some of us would understand how bad that is for Jewish listeners, right? For the Pharisees that are listening, they would understand, but Jewish people really didn't like pigs, right? As you know, like Jewish people don't even eat pigs, right? That's why they have to have kosher meals. They don't, as much as for us that are Gentiles and we're saved by grace, we love bacon, it's so good, right? And I told my wife who's Korean, she doesn't like bacon, like, bacon's amazing, we should have it each breakfast, right? But for Jewish people, you don't not only not eat pigs, you don't even go near pigs. You don't take care of pigs. They're known as filthy animals, right? Like, don't you know those pigs eat poop? Those pigs, they roll around in their filth. Why would you do that, right? But this son was so poor, right? If you know what pigs eat, they can eat literally anything, even mold. You throw them trash and pigs gratefully eat it. But the son was so poor, he looked at the food the pigs were eating and he says, even the trash that pigs eat look better than starving. That's just how like lowly he's become, right? That's the level of reckless living. I imagine his boss, right? It says like in 
uh, 15, 16, right? I imagine the boss would say, hey, you can't even eat the pigs. You're not that worthy. You're not valuable enough to even eat the pigs. The pigs are more valuable than you, which I guess makes sense if there's a famine in a country. But can you imagine that? It's better for you to eat the trash of the pigs than for you to eat the pigs. Wow. For him to have a boss that has the mentality, he's probably thinking about, man, you know, when I think about it, when I was under my father, I never had to worry about my daily bread. I never had to worry about if I'll be loved. I never had to worry about if I'll have a bed. I never had to worry about if I was okay or not. Because my father took care of everything. So that's why in verses 17, he says this. But when he came to himself, he, he came back to his senses, right? He said, how many of my father's higher servants have more than enough bread, but here I perish with hunger, right? This, this son is saying, man, my father has so much love. My father fed servants even better than I am being fed under this terrible boss. My, my father's servants, my father's friends, my father's nephews, they're so much in a better place because of my father's love than I am right now. Why would I think that it was better to do things without my father than to be with him? I imagine the sinners and tax collectors just thinking, man, I, Jesus, I had to choose this way because don't you know that if I, if I didn't do it, I would have starved to death. Jesus, if, if I really did it God the Father's way, like I would have starved or I couldn't take care of my family. But I was tricked and I didn't know. And I'm sorry. That's why in verses 18, the son, when he came back to himself, he said, verse 18, I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your higher servants. And he arose and came to his father. But as he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Can I be honest? When I used to preach this message a long time ago, as I read this passage and I was talking with, with the Lord, I was like, Lord, this son is such a hustler. He's capping. He's lying. Like, he's a con man. He's like writing the script. Oh, I'm so hungry. Father, I'm so sorry. Just take me back as your son. I, just, I really thought this son was such a, was such a con man. Like, what a li liar. Just because he wanted food, that he'll give this fake apology, right? You know, I really thought for some reason he was like the child. When you know like those kids, I know you guys are in elementary school, but there's always that one kid who does something wrong, right? He hits the other kid, and because he doesn't want to get in trouble, right? The parents say, hey, Jimmy, you should apologize. And Jimmy's like, oh, I'm sorry, right? And you're like, oh, like that's not a real apology, right? And I really used to think the son was giving a fake apology. But I realized because the way in which he goes back, right? Even the journey to go back, the humiliation and the shame that he has to take on. You know what? I understand. Because I said, Father, you're dead to me. I don't deserve to be his son. That I should be dead to him. But if my father is gracious enough, I, I'm, I'm okay and I, I would even be happier to be his servant than to be a stranger to him. I know that I don't deserve for him to take me back because just because I wanted him dead, he should also see me as dead. But I know it's even better to go back and be a servant than to be a stranger. And I realize that there's a level where even if he doesn't fully understand his apology, that I don't think he's capping. I don't think he's lying. And I really imagine that this is how the sinners around Jesus must have felt. Can you imagine the, the tax collectors? God, I'm so sorry that, that I thought money was more important than taking care of your people. And I betrayed my fellow people because money was more important. I know I don't deserve it because money was my God, but I'm so sorry. 
Can you imagine the prostitutes? God, I know this was just, it was supposed to be a sacred thing, but, but I couldn't trust that you would provide money for me. And I chose this way. And I know I don't, I don't deserve to go back, but will you take me back? I'm so sorry. Even the other sinners, God, I, I should have been so happy to be your son, but I threw that away. And I don't deserve to be your child again, but will you please take me back? That's exactly how the sinners felt. And I love it because when the son, right, if you look in verses 18 and 19, he had, a, he had a script. He had two sentences, right? But it's so crazy when he actually sees the father, the father runs to him, right? The father runs to him and kisses him and embraces him. And the son only shared half of the script, right? In verse 21, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. The father immediately stops him. I love it. He doesn't get to finish the second sentence, right? Verses 22, but the father said to his servant, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. I love this because can you imagine the son is beginning his, what he practiced like, Lord, I'm so sorry. I, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father immediately says, stop. Don't even finish that sentence. It will break my heart. Don't say it. You, please bring the robe. Not any robe. Verse 22 says, bring the best robe. Put it on him. Get a ring, put it on his hand, put shoes on his feet. I think for those of us who maybe are just really Americans, we won't fully understand this, but we have to look at it, right? It's not like, it's not like in the American context, right? Where the father's saying, hey, go bring the Nike hoodie, go bring the Jordan ones, and go bring that diamond ring, 24 carats. That's not what's going on right here, right? Because in Jewish, Customs, especially when we look at the Old Testament, what does the robe represent, right? In Genesis, when, when Joseph was given by, by uh, Isaac this, this robe, right? This robe of dreams, Isaac, or when, uh, when Jacob said and gave that to Joseph, yes, I believe in your dreams, and you will carry on the family legacy, right? It's like those clothing that you wear as your family, right? You represent our family. Not only that, but the ring, right? We see that in Genesis as well, when, when the uh, Pharaoh gave to Joseph the, the signet ring. And what that means is, you make the decisions on my behalf. Servants do not get to make decisions for the family because they're servants, but you are my child, and you have a say in this family. Put this ring on. You have a say in my family, right? And then shoes, lastly, is just like in Genesis, shoes are not worn by servants, shoes are not worn by prisoners. And the father said, no, you are not a prisoner under my house. You are not a servant in my house. You are my child. Your position is elevated. And then he says, go and bring the fattened calf. It's so interesting, right? The other land, there's a famine. There's no food. And the father saying, bring the fattest calf which is super funny. There's no food, but they would give food enough for this, this beautiful cow to eat, right? And say, the fattest steak you got, bring it. Because this is the love I have for my son. And this is the beauty of repentance. Repentance is not, hey, I suck. Hey, you suck. Hey, this is terrible. Repentance is, hey, we're not in the will of the Father. Let's go back to the Father. Repentance is, I tried to do it my way and I failed. I want to turn back to the Father. Right? Repentance is, I don't deserve to go back to the will of the Father. But Lord, if it by your grace, will you please take me back? That is repentance. Repentance is not, you are stupid, so stop it. Repentance is, turn back to the Father. My wife has a cousin. I, I didn't get to see this, but she shared this story. But one of her cousins, like, he was jumping so happy and he accidentally hit her in the face with his head, right? And, of course, my wife's nose was in pain and she was shocked. And this cousin just looks at her in shock. And he just starts to, like, talk to himself. Stupid, stupid me. Stupid I have become. 
stupid I am, right? So he almost sounded like Gollum, right, from Lord of the Rings. Stupid me, Schmigor, stupid, right? It's, and sometimes we think that's what repentance is, right? Father, I'm so stupid. I can't do better. I'm so dumb. But that's not repentance. Repentance is go back to your father and even though we don't deserve it because of his grace and because of Jesus Christ, he will take us back. So turn back to the father. So when we walk in repentance, what happens is it's not just Wow, I suck. And then we teach other people that they suck. Yes, it's true. It's you left the Father. I left the Father. Let's repent and go back to the Father. Right? So many people in the world, Lord, I wish you were dead to me. I want to do it my way. Me, 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 me. But repentance is, Lord, I'm sorry. It's no longer about me. I want to go back to doing it with you. I want to come back home. I want to go back to the table. I don't know why I got lost. Oh, never mind. And so why do I share this? Well, uh, Mr. Robertson told me that you guys have been going through um, Corinthians, right? And, and communal living. Like, what does it mean to be reconciled in Christ and living as a community? And it's actually not possible with repentance. And what I'm not saying is to look to one another and say, hey, you, you should repent. You, you're bad, right? That's not what I'm saying, right? You don't need to have the signs and the pitchfork, right? What I'm saying is, to be in true community, it's a group of people that have gathered and say, I want what God the Father wants more than what I want. Jesus, I want to be the perfect son like you, and I want to be reconciled to the Father. And when you have a group of people that truly say that and live it, that's when you can have true communal living and reconciliation. I imagine when Jesus finished up to this point of the parable, the Pharisees were just like, yeah. Oh, like, if I was the father, I would never take that son back. The Pharisees could not understand grace because they've never truly walked in repentance. And in the same way I say to you, if you do not walk in repentance, you cannot show grace to one another. I'm going to finish with how Jesus finished the parable in verse 25. In verse 25, it says this. Now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened cat because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but, his father, but he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you, I've never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him, right? The, the older brother hated it, just like the Pharisees hated that these sinners, prostitutes, and tax collectors were repenting and entering the kingdom of heaven. They didn't like it. Look how much I do for the father. Look how much better I am. The father should love me more. I'd imagine if the older brother truly lived in repentance, he will go to the father and say, Father, I gotta be honest, I really don't like that younger brother. He wished you were dead, I really don't like him. I really think he's terrible. And can you imagine the father telling the son, thank you for sharing that with me. But can I share, I love your brother. I love my child. Can you also turn away from your hatred and love him the way I love him? That is how you have true communal grace and reconciliation under repentance. And that's only possible with Christ because Jesus, the good older brother said, you know what? These people don't deserve it, but I would die on the cross for them to reconcile them to my father. Let me die on the cross and reconcile them so that the moment they say, Father, I'm so sorry, let me come back home. Because of my grace, that would always be open. I believe that is open for you guys today. For some of you who maybe have just been struggling, I don't really feel as though I am near God, or I feel as though I'm not accepted, or I've been doing it my own way, or how come I'm not seeing what God wants, or what's, what's going on? I'm going to share that more in the next message, but um, only one practical point for this first message is, will you open your heart in repentance? 
And it doesn't have to be stupid me. Stupid me. It could just be so simple. Father, I don't want to do it my way any longer. I want to do it your way. And I surrender myself to do it your way. Let me pray for us. I went over five minutes, so I'll take it from the next message. I'll make the next one shorter. Let me pray and we'll end. Yeah. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that because of what you've done on that cross, you've reconciled us with, to the Father. And you only ask that we turn to the Father, turn away from ourselves, turn away from our sins, and turn to you. I pray the space between this first message and the retreat and the second one, Lord, that you would just prepare our hearts to now walk from repentance to the next step of grace to receive. And so we just thank you. Lord, I pray that even as um, many students and parents and teachers listen to this message, that something would open up and they would turn to you and find you and know you. Lord, we thank you and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.